So uh, first of all, uh, welcome to all the participants in our online gender talk. Uh, this gender talk is organized by the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. Uh, and it's the aim of the gender talk is to have like an open dialogue uh, to actually together uh, find out the new trends of gender equality within the perspective of lifelong learning, uh, but also to find opportunities to uh, tackle gender inequalities within lifelong learning and provide equal opportunities to everyone. In our today's uh, first gender talk, uh, which will be a series of other uh, gender talks that will be coming in the next month, we will focus on discussing uh, gendered lifelong learning in the times of inflation. So in this uh, gender talk today, we will explore together the interaction or the intersection of gender and lifelong learning and focusing on the challenges and opportunities that might raise during the times of the inflation. So giving this uh, overview, I would like to welcome you again all the participants and also the speakers, which I will introduce them uh, just in a few minutes. My name is Samah Shalabi, and I'm so pleased to be with you today. I'm an education specialist at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, based in Hamburg. Also, I'm the gender focal point for the Institute. As mentioned earlier, uh, today we are all facing, I mean, the economics, uh, challenges, but also more specifically the inflation, the increase in the inflation rates. And of course, this economic challenging economic landscape that's happening right now, it uh, has also an impact on our daily life, it has an impact on our societies, but also on the economy as a whole. This is inflation can impact access to education, employment opportunities, but also the overall well being. So it's important maybe to highlight today in our discussion how the inflation from a gender perspective is affecting our daily life decisions and also how we are our expectations can affect uh, the, the whole economy and how this also our expectation can be impactful to, for the overall economy recovery and stability. However, it's important also to highlight that creating resi resilient societies and resilient economies, they would require individuals who acquire the knowledge and the skills to be part of the solution and also the prosperity. Therefore, we see that lifelong learning and other education could have the chance through its flexibility, learning modalities, and also tailor-made programs to provide the individuals, regardless of their age, gender, or even social context, with the skills and the knowledge needed to be resilient in the time of the uh, economic fluctuation and downturns. So today, uh, our experts with us will share their insights and experience to explore, as said earlier, the intersection where gender lifelong learning and economic resilience meet. They would also highlight or share with us uh, maybe insights on how uh, the, the inflation or the dimension, the gender dimension of inflation, and explain how economic crises uh, disproportionately affect different genders. We will also define together with our speakers today the key competences that individuals would need to make informed economic decisions, and of course the role of lifelong learning in providing people with these skills to navigate challenges or challenging economic periods. Then please allow me to welcome uh, our speakers, our speakers for today, distinguished speakers. Uh, first of all, I will start with introducing uh, Miss Claire Seller. And please, uh, apologies if there's any uh, mispronunciation. So Miss Claire Seller, uh, Seller is an assistant uh, associate professor of finance at Rotman. Before joining Rotman, uh, Ms. Claire uh, was an assistant professor at the University of Zurich. Also, Ms. Claire has a research interest including household finance, financial innovation, and banking. Her work has been published in a lot of academic and non-academic journals, uh, including the quarterly journal of economics, and has raised the interest of several central banks around the world, such as the European Central Bank, and the UK financial contact. So please welcome with me, Mr. Claire Sreck. 
I would also so pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Mr. Salim Arji, is the first Economic Affairs Officer at the UN Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, known as ISQA. He is currently leading the, the Future of Work Initiative at the UN ESQA. His research agenda is very wide and is focused on inclusive growth, labor market, private sector development, employment creation, and the future of work. So please welcome with me uh, the speakers of today. And without further ado, we will just go directly to the discussion of today. And the first question I would give it to uh, Mr. Ms. Claire Serrach to ask her, maybe to set for us the scene of the inflation situation today. How is it globally? And maybe how also inflation is impacting, of course, individuals within gender perspective. So please, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, so inflation is high. Uh, it's likely to persist. It varies across countries, but uh, if we take a historical perspective, we are facing high level of inflation and much higher than we were like just one or maybe two years ago. Uh, so there is a there has been a huge gap in uh, in inflation expectation if we take the perspective of uh, of households. So a huge jump over the last two years. And so how it affects uh, individuals, so it affects individuals in a heterogeneous way. And, and so we know that uh, low-income households and, and, and women in particular are more likely to be affected by, uh, by inflation. And so it's, uh, it, and it's also increasing a lot uncertainty for these households. So when we think about women and, in, 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 and the low-income populations, they, they already face two types of uncertainty. So high income uncertainty, uh, because usually they work like with uh, part-time positions or they have a high risk of uh, unemployment. They also face a high risk of um, uh, expense uncertainty uh, because, because they live in more precarious situations. They are not covered by insurance. Uh, they can use, for example, a car that is older and so on. So the, these households and these women in particular, they already face income uncertainty, expense uncertainty. So there is a lot of volatility. And on top of that, with inflation, they're facing today a price uncertainty. So we see that all these uncertainties are piling up, which increases a lot the vulnerability of, uh, of low-income households and, and in particular women. And so, and so women are even more exposed to all these uncertainties because they tend to work more on part-time uh, jobs for short-term positions. Uh, they are likely to face most of the um, uh, expenses related to food and so on in a household. Uh, and so they experience uh, even more like the... And also when you think about inflation today, we know that there is a high level of inflation, but it's not the same level of inflation for all goods. Okay, so inflation is mostly affecting uh, food and gas, which is a large part of the budget of low-income populations and even more for, for women. So these households face a higher level of, uh, of inflation if you take into account their, uh, their budget and, and expenses. Thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, answer and, of course, for highlighting maybe this uh, kind of... Uh, uh, intersectorial challenges. Uh, but maybe I would allow me to come back to another question. Do you think that the gender, let's say the consumer behavior or the economic behavior of different genders can also influence the inflation trends? So uh, this is, for example, if a, from a man to a woman or even other gender, how they are reacting, how they are perceiving the gender rates in the future. Would this uh, somehow changing the behavior in the market and ultimately will change the economic recovery? So th there are three ways um, inflation perception and expectations or behavior related to behaviors related to inflation can affect inflation itself. So there is a kind of feedback loop. The first way is that if if individuals perceive that inflation is high and expect inflation to still be high, they might increase demand today to avoid facing even higher prices tomorrow. 
And if demand increases two days, then there is even more pressure on prices. And so prices are even more likely to, to increase. That's the first way. The second way is that if they're able to negotiate higher wages, so they expect inflation to be high in the future. And so they negotiate higher wages, which are increasing production costs. And then inflation will, will come more from the supply side, like from firms. And so it's likely to, 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 in, to increase inflation even more. Uh, then on a bit... Uh, the opposite way, uh, central banks, when they take into account their money, like when they consider how to set policy weights, uh, they take into account inflation expectations. And so if inflation expectations are higher, they might they might uh, increase rates even uh, even more, which in this case should should lead to a lower growth and, and lower inflation in the future. So we see that definitely uh, household perception of inflation or, and expectation on behaviors related to, to inflation do affect uh, the economy in, in the long run. It's not clear uh, which effect which effect will uh, will dominate. What, what I would say though is that even if we think about monetary policy, it can a bit go in both directions because um, so for example, it's like uh, low-income households, they face higher level of inflation because because food is a higher part of uh, of their uh, their budget. Uh, but if you if you look at average inflation number, it does not reflect exactly what low-income households are, are perceiving. And so maybe there would be there could be a lag in how central banks react uh, compared to what exactly low-income households are are facing. And so that's why I think it's really important to take into account the heterogeneity. Uh, of um, inflation across the population so that central banks act on time to and put more weight on these populations that are much more vulnerable and potentially act uh, quicker if if needed uh, because this this time it took a while for, for central banks to react and now they're reacting very fast and quickly but we don't know what will be the, the uh, consequences on uh, on on growth so so yes, so there, there, are, there are definitely uh, consequences of, of uh, individual expectations and, and, and perception of, of inflation that should be taken into account also by, uh, by central banks and, and regulators. Thank you very much. Uh, so taking this into account and maybe the different uh, perspective or perceptions for the inflation from the individuals, but also from the gender lens, because maybe it's a different from a woman to a man when it comes to the perception or even different gender. I would maybe uh, give the question, the floor to uh, Mr. Salim uh, Arji, uh, to ask in terms of these challenges that we are facing nowadays, uh, maybe we need to get more skills uh, that can make us as an individuals, uh, of course, navigate our way in terms of the inflation rate, but also the economic fluctuation. So what are these skills and how would these skills would be different from a gender to another or how we can make it in another way gender responsive uh, skills and also learning opportunities? The floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, Claire. Hi, everybody. Um, I, first of all, I wanted to thank you for inviting me for, to this interesting talk uh, and timely one. Um, in fact, uh, Claire said it all about the impact of inflation about different uh, genders around, uh, around the world. And I wanted to add a couple of points that this might be, uh, um, the, the issue might be exacerbated in our part of the world when we talk about the impact of inflation on gender, uh, uh, on gender disaggregation, let's say. Uh, and I wanted to add that uh, in our part of the world, around 80% of the female working are working in the informal sector. Uh, or in an informal employment uh, type of um, uh, contracts, which makes them more vulnerable, as you mentioned, uh, as Claire mentioned, uh, to uh, more uh, vulnerability and uh, uh, to be impacted significantly uh, by, um, by inflation. Um, we also, uh, uh, this is let alone uh, those that are uh, do, domestic house do, do, uh, that are working uh, um, in unpaid care uh, work uh, uh, staying at home where they are 
in the presence of inflation and also in the presence uh, of uh, imported inflation that is the case from most countries uh, of the ESCO region, this put females at a higher risk of being poor compared to males due to the impact of inflation. Uh, this was evident in multiple household surveys where they uh, look at who falls um, in, in our analysis at ESCO on multidimensional poverty, uh, who falls under poverty in a given consumption shock. And it was evident that females are more prone to uh, be more poor um, in, in, in when, when, when things get more expensive. Uh, this is to start with. Uh, the second part is, do we need new skills? Definitely we do. Our research has so shown that uh, the majority of female owning a business, I'm just giving an example here, uh, around 80 to 90% of them are working in small and micro, micro and small enterprises. What does that say? That says that these small and micro enterprises and mainly in the informal sector, uh, their profit margin is significantly low. And uh, their uh, profit, um, as I mentioned, the profit margin is significantly low. And they are prone to economic crisis significantly more than any type of firms. Given this background, um, and experiences from the current cri inflation crisis around the world, and especially in our part of the world where central banks are having a pegged currency, and by definition, and uh, Dr. Claire would uh, 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 confirm this with me as well, uh, that they don't have any inflation targeting anyways. They just go with the targets of the uh, countries that they're pegging their country with. So. This will uh, help these, um, uh, th this will put additional pressure on females in our regions, especially in countries with fixed exchange rate, uh, to be more prone for the inflation issues and to reduce their, let's say, the demand for the products that they will produce and put them out of, out of business, specifically uh, uh, since the higher inflation rates will curb consumption and by definition will reduce profits for uh, micro and small enterprises. The, all these issues will lead to a lower income to females and to and increase the gender gap in our part of the region, which is already the, the biggest worldwide anyways. And I'm talking about the Western Asia region. Um, now the role of reskilling in, in, in skills in general. Um, business owners, and I'm talking about micro and small enterprises, they are the least who get trainings, um, in different kinds of trainings. Well, let's say, for example, financial literacy training, uh, uh, resilience training in, the, um, in, uh, in, the, in, in light of shocks. And this was evident during the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, where um, uh, most uh, firms, and especially those owned by women, uh, did not know how to manage to, be, uh, to, to cope with the prices or to have any contingency plan or any risk mitigation plans which made female business owners to go bankrupt significantly earlier than males. And by definition, males, they own medium and large firms significantly more than females. So why I'm saying that? I'm saying that is that because if we wanted to start training, reskilling and upskilling programs, there should be, first of all, uh, uh, a nationwide or 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 uh, or a master plan on how first of all to make small and medium enterprises more successful and grow uh, uh, grow more. Uh, the second thing is to try to uh, uh, create programs that would enhance female business owners how to cope with. Uh, a crisis 
such as the inflation mm, crisis or um, or any type of crisis that they may face. This is, I'm talking about the business owners. If we talk to employees and um, uh, 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 looking at the research that we have done, we have seen that uh, the highest, we all know that female employment is low in all sectors. However, based on the enterprise surveys, we have seen that the demand for female employment is the highest in uh, the um, uh, ICTS sector. Um, the, the, um, it's it's higher than other sectors, however, low, significantly low compared to males anyways. So what we are trying to say is that since the females might have a potential in specific sectors, and, and what I'm, I'm, I'm giving an example about uh, ICTS sector, uh, reskilling and upskilling could be a great option for for female employees in such sectors to create uh, a, a better future. Now, I'm not trying, and, and one additional advantage of such a sector is could be done remotely. I'm not saying that females have to stay at home and get an ICT sector and do the uh, uh, unpaid work at home as well, which creates more burden on them. However, we are saying that in countries similar to the ones that we have here in, in, in our region, the Western Asia, where there are political instability and there are significantly high level of norms, this sector might be promising in, to enhance females' capacity in it in order in, in, to, to mitigate any risks coming from uh, working after hours or working in political instable nations and at the same time still making income and still sustain any shocks similar to the one that we are facing now, which is the inflation shock. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, really uh, insightful and comprehensive. I think it just uh, shared with us also a part of the challenges, but also what kind of skills giving also existing challenges uh, in the uh, labor market uh, and maybe if you allow me to wrap up here so uh, just maybe the entrepreneurship skills is key uh, to also empower women and please let me know if you agree on this To it's a key uh, skill in terms of uh, or in times of inflation and this is can also have uh, help women to be more resilient in any of uh, economic fluctuation, but especially in the inflation time. Uh, just maybe, dear participants, uh, I would like uh, to uh, highlight that we will, of course, it's an interactive. So if you have any questions to our distinguished speakers today, please feel free to post it in the question and answers. And of course, we will take this on board. Uh, also, we will open afterwards a sort of an opinion survey uh, on the questions, so please stay with us until the end, uh, of, um, um, until the end of this uh, talk to get your view, but also to get your opinion about the next topic of our gender talk. Ms. Claire, uh, allow me please to ask you maybe the same question that we have heard from Mr. Uh, Salim uh, Arji about the skills. Also from your view, what are the key skills that are needed? for the individuals, maybe on the daily life, day-to-day -day interaction, to build, uh, to make them more resilient in the time of the economic downturns. Uh, <clears throat> yes, with pleasure, thank you very much. So I will talk from, the, from my perspective of a uh, professor of finance. Uh, so I do think that it's extremely important to think about the informal sector and, and entrepreneurship. And and uh, and uh, Salim did a great job explaining uh, that, so I will not not come back uh, not come back to this. Um, but from from uh, from uh, the perspective of a finance professor, so one one thing that is really important is to help households and women to better uh, like allocate their funds over time, and so to think about potentially how and when to save. And the other side of uh, of saving is is borrowing. So uh, how and when to to borrow, uh, and so uh, to get a good understanding of uh, of uh, of this, I think it's really important to 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 make sure that people understand what inflation is, 
and what uh, it implies for their, uh, for their savings. So what we know is that if inflation is high, if the savings are just kept at home or on a 0% account, then the value of the savings uh, progressively decreases. And so households should be aware that there are, uh, in, at least in developed economies, ways to save uh, your money in a savings account or a guaranteed uh, account with a level of interest rate what re that reflects a bit the level of, uh, of, uh, of inflation to make sure that the value of the savings don't progressively uh, decrease. So I'll take from the perspective of the country where I'm living. So for example, in Canada, Uh, it's impressive how households just keep their, uh, their money in a, in, a, in a current account with 0% uh, interest rates, while, while there are ways to save your money in 5% accounts where the money is totally guaranteed and so on, but just households are not aware of the effect of inflation on, uh, on, uh, on savings. Um, and uh, the other side of, uh, so it's really important for households to be, to be aware of uh, What is inflation? What is affect for their how it affects their savings, and what are the options in the countries they're living to to save safely, but still getting a, a return for for their saving as much as possible. Um, and and uh, the other side of it is is boring. On the other hand, what we see is that when households face more uncertainty, so even more so in times of inflation, they tend to rely more on. Uh, alternative sources of uh, of uh, of credit, such as, for example, payday loans in America, but also informal credit, which comes with very high interest rates, and so which can put households in a kind of poverty trap, where like they're facing difficult situations, so they borrow at extremely high interest rates, and then the rest of their income is uh, used to to face expenses or to or to reimburse uh, the loans. And so, and so that the same. What, what is really needed is an understanding of what is really an interest rate, uh, if we take, or, or what is what is really inflation, to make sure that households make proper uh, decisions about their savings and uh, and uh, and how they uh, how they borrow money. Uh, they need to be aware of uh, of the cost of uh, alternative credit, which is very often extremely. Uh, high and and also the opportunity cost of, of keeping their savings at home or in a, in a, in a, in an account that does not offer proper interest rates um and so it's like it's it it's it's uh, it's really about educating households about what inflation is and what are interest rates and what is the effect of composed interest rates and this i think is really first order um and so and i think it should start really at school like if you just show a a basic curve to students of what it means to save money when there is a 5% interest rate and how it goes over time. Uh, at the same time, what it means exactly for uh, your wealth to borrow at a level of, uh, with an interest rate of 20 or 30% annually, what it implies. And I think these are skills that can be learned and should be taught at a very early age uh, from school. Uh, we could also think of a basic financial literacy training when, for example, people start employment in a new company, uh, they will get their first wages and so maybe a basic basic uh, financial literacy training. Uh, it doesn't need to be long, it doesn't need to be extensive, it's really about understanding what is inflation, how it is measured, what are interest rates, and how it can affect their savings and, and, uh, and, 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 and borrowing. Thank you very much. And this is uh, exactly, I think this is uh, somehow uh, summarizes the complexity of this issue with skills that we need on day to day. So, but also that can enable us to be in the labor market, as uh, Mr. Selim said. However, maybe you have mentioned some of the key partners that maybe can deliver this skills or knowledge. You mentioned the schools. Uh, and also dedicated uh, financial literacy programs. The question also for both of you, uh, whom are the key partners uh, that you see them that are maybe can play a key role to give the knowledge for the individuals? Because we as an adult, uh, maybe not all of us, we have the knowledge about the financial literacy, even within different uh, education levels. Uh, and maybe we are getting a lot of sources uh, of the information from the media, from the social media, 
which is somehow impacting our decisions. So, uh, as you know, maybe lifelong learning is a very wide. So it goes for informal learning also, where we can, like this talk, it's an informal learning. We're just uh, sharing our views together and getting insights. So the question uh, to you uh, back, uh, Ms. Claire, who uh, also other partners can support adults and youths to get knowledge? And then the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Sari, please. Uh, so I'll start. Yeah, so I talked about about schools because I think it, it goes very easily with uh, with any within any math program, um, and so that should be a good application of of uh, of math learning. Um, then I would say, of course, central banks. So central banks because their policy is about targeting, like because one of their main objective is to 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 target inflation. Uh, they should, I think, and they we they do, in uh, in some countries and some instances, provide material uh, for us to learn more about about uh, inflation and uh, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the and and its impact, um, and um, and then I, I said I said the employers as much as possible when we know that there is a new employee who's going to receive its first wages. Um, the same, it can be very short, a very short training to understand like how price dynamics can affect the purchasing power of the wage and what decision can be made about saving and, and borrowing uh, over the life cycle. I think could be could be very useful. So these are the three partners I would I would mention. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Salim, uh, also the same question to you. Who are the key partners that you, you see that they can uh, provide the knowledge for youth and adults uh, through different channels, uh, either informal learning, non-formal learning? Okay, uh, are you talking about inflation and in, in, in gaining capacity on inflation or skills in general? In skills in general, when it comes to maybe financial skills, sure. that skills that can make sure. individuals resilient in time of economic uh, fluctuation. Mm. Or um, okay, um, we uh, we we rolled out. I, I just want to give you based on our experience that we did the, for like for example after the explosion in Beirut, we rolled out twenty five thousand licenses through Coursera for Lebanese citizens. Um, by definition, and having it through Coursera, we screened out people in rural areas and um, in some cases refugees uh, and those that do not have access to internet and access to uh, ICT infrastructure. Why I'm saying that this is this is very important because the way you provide the knowledge is uh, 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 it will create the impact, whether it's going to create a positive impact or a neutral impact. Um, majority of females in our region who are, mm, I'm, I'm talking on average, are working in the agricultural sector, where they main, the, and let's talk about Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Jordan, etc. cetera, um, and non-GCC. Uh, they live in rural areas. Any type of the novel techniques to gain knowledge about a certain skill is not available for them, whether due to the lack of uh, computer literacy or the lack of being uh, up to date with how trainings are being given. So that put us at a challenge that if we wanted to help the majority of entrepreneurs or those women that would try to be entrepreneurs in our region, we need to start with them at the basic stages, which is the original way of doing things, which means by utilizing the efforts of ministries, NGOs, international organizations such as UNESCO and ILO, et cetera, to build many courses in their hometowns to provide them with the needed information and then bring them up to the needed capacity to, to be on the track of lifelong long learning. Besides that, 
they will be definitely stuck in a non, uh, 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 um, how can I call it, um, on, a, on an informal uh, way or, or, or um, a very basic way of doing business or working in a given sector. This was evident in uh, multiple areas in, in our projects that we are carrying. And at the same time, uh, 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 it, it showed ineffectiveness uh, when we tried to roll, novel, roll out novel tools in order to upskill people in rural or countries with conflict. Uh, the, the, the nature of these countries in, of our countries compared to Europe and to uh, North America is completely different. There is an initial condition on how to help these people upskill. And uh, the right way is to have uh, an, an inclusive plan or that, could, or not an inclusive plan, definitely it has to be inclusive, a sustainable plan that could take them from zero to 100. One additional thing that we have figured out also is that uh, this might not be a schooling uh, that is for long. Micro-credential projects, uh, um, classes, as Claire mentioned, would definitely be beneficial, especially that majority of the females who are running a business or working in an, an informal way they are doing some basic work that might not require longer period of trainings over time. Provided this micro-credential programs, or they call it sometimes nano-credential programs that, has, that we, could be offered by uh, NGOs, international organizations, even ministry, respective ministries, Ministry of Education, Higher Education, Ministry of Youth, Ministry of uh, Labor, etc could be key partners in enhancing employability as well as uh, entrepreneurship for females. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think with these uh, answers, we maybe got very clear insights that to the skills uh, that we would need, of course, in the time of the inflation. Uh, and maybe this also can help the policy makers when it comes to uh, adapting or developing even lifelong learning strategies to take these skills into consideration. Then uh, maybe on the policy level, uh, especially when it comes to the lifelong learning uh, policies or even education policies, um, I would just maybe uh, ask the, the question uh, to both of you, if you have any uh, maybe examples from countries that really take into consideration the, the, the maybe financial literacy or even the skills that are relevant uh, for uh, individuals to empower them in times of economics, uh, economics downturns into the, the lifelong learning policies. Uh, so maybe Mr. Salim, also Mr. Claire, if you have any maybe examples from countries uh, that adapted such policies, education policies to empower individuals with such skills. Uh, whom, whom do you want to, uh, to start? Um, yes, I, I can start with you. Yes, please. Okay, so you, you're asking about person about experiences based on the work that we have done. Definitely. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna go. Them. I'm gonna go um, with the example that we did with Coursera uh, most recently. Um, in, in fact, not recently. It was in 2020 for 25,000 uh, Lebanese individuals that. Uh, uh, took uh, any course they would like and um, as much uh, as much courses as they would like uh, and we have the data on, on all of those. I wanted to say that majority of those who the, 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 the highest percentage among gender who took the class are females. So majority of the majority of those who, took a class and finish it, we're females. The second thing, um, the most unemployed of, among these people were females as well. That tells us a good story that females 
it's not like they don't want it to be in the marketplace. They want it to be in their working as hard as anybody else in order to get the job that they would um, sustain their living. This is the case of Lebanon. So uh, the biggest issue that we have shown and which is a policy, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, it's the um, policy people or the government's role to do is to train the people on the skills that are needed in the market and not on any skills that are there. So based on the, the data that we have, uh, almost 90% of the females that took the classes, took classes that are not demanded in the labor market. However, around 10% took classes that are the top, I would say 20, uh, uh, 20 skills that are demanded in the Lebanese market. So um, additional information, and this is the role of policymakers, would provide more guidance for lifelong learning for females in order to be more strategic about their choices, about what uh, uh, learning route they should take and where is uh, uh, the, uh, the, needed, uh, the, the needed skills in the market that where we guarantee for them uh, a, a dignified living, if you wanted to say, through getting a job. So this is our, based on our example, um, some insights of what we have faced. And that's why we came out with the ESCO Skills Monitor, which is a monitor that uh, in, it's, it's available online for everybody where we can detect the demand for skills for everybody, for the 20 countries uh, that we're working on. So any design of any program of this kind would let people be more mindful about the needed skills and jobs in the market and do the lifelong learning in a, in a more informed way. We have participated with sister agencies multiple times. It, previously, it was checking, ticking the box that we wanted to train, just for the sake of example, females on how to do um, traditional Lebanese food. Whether this is needed or not, we just ticked the box and we provided the training. However, after like two, three months, four months, five months, after the program is done, these females are unemployed. So now we're offering at Esqua this tool, Esqua Skills Monitor, that would provide insights about all the needed skills where any programs that could be done, whether through UNESCO, ILO, UNDP in our countries, would be definitely more informed and design this, the, the, the programs that would definitely uh, 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 talk to the real world and the demand of skills in the real world, whether for women or for everybody. Yeah, thank you very much for giving this uh, practical, maybe, uh, examples uh, on a country level. Uh, Ms. Claire, the same question to you. Maybe in Canada, you know that there are some examples of education policies that we took into consideration, this financial literacy or even other literacy that can uh, enable the individuals to be more resilient in the economic uh, uh, challenging time. So I don't know the detail, but I know that schools are increasingly including financial literacy in, in their program. Um, I, I don't have an expertise in lifelong learning. Uh, I'm not the same expertise as, as Salim. I would just uh, I, um, totally agree with, uh, with Salim on the point that it's really important to have a focus uh, learning approach. Uh, because what we do observe in, in the research about uh, financial literacy is that if it's not very focused, it has a very limited effect. Uh, and so even if we provide financial literacy programs, they don't really affect people, people uh, saving and, and borrowing decisions. So that's why it's really too important that these programs are very short, 
focused and and with a clear um, link to to the to the real world to maximize uh, their impact because unfortunately um, education has has its limits in terms of affecting uh, people uh, pe people people decisions um, I think the earlier the better uh, in terms of the life. Uh, so starting at school is is very good, but but also it's really important that it's it remains really focused also to give the so that so that people realize that it's not that difficult and that complex and are not afraid or scared by these uh, these programs. So keep it simple, focus on the key principle, show their, how they can really affect people's lives, and and I think this is what will make them ex ex effective because. Again, we do observe in the research a limit, limited effect of financial literacy program in, in general. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe again, I would like to remind our participants, if you have any questions, if you'd like to engage with our speakers today, please feel free to use the option of the question and A to post any of your questions or even some of your experiences that you would like to share with us or even programs uh, around the, the topic that we are discussing today. Um, also, I think I have seen uh, one question. Uh, may I ask uh, to the distinguished speakers uh, whether they have research on women leadership in political, economic, and social spheres? Any empirical uh, findings on how to support women in covering leadership roles? So this is a question from the floor. Um, maybe. Uh, I would ask uh, first, uh, Mr. Salim, if you would like to react to it. Shall uh, I repeat the question mm, once more? No, no, it's clear. Uh, we we have done at ESQUA multiple work on uh, female economic empowerment. And we have realized that there is a glass ceiling where females would reach a certain level of uh, uh, of, of managerial position, and they stop. If you look at the report that uh, I have the, the, the pleasure to uh, to lead a couple, couple of years, uh, years ago, it's called towards a more productive and inclusive path, uh, employment creation in the Arab region. You would see the percentage of, the, 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 the very dim percentage of females in leadership position or management position you know, and you could see also classification in which sectors there. You, we have realized that females are reaching a point they they go into. First of all, they ha get hired less. Second of all, when they get hired, they get paid less. When even when they get paid less in managerial position, they stop at a certain level where the percentage of females being leaders in a in a given firm. Uh, compared to uh, men is very low. I, if I understand also in the p political arena, it's very obvious from uh, uh, our parliament structure, our ministries, cabinet of minister, ministers, at least at, at the countries that I'm representing or we're working with, it's significantly min minimal. There are also, this is a funny example, is that a minister of uh, of women in multiple countries is a male in in uh, in our part of the world. Um, that being said, um, the, the large initiatives at the global level and at the regional level should be tailored in order to enhance the role of female in economic and political uh, inclusion in order to have a, a better well-being for uh, for females i hope i i answered the question uh, as you mentioned uh, thank you so much uh, maybe also to add that at the uh, unesco institute for lifelong learning we have also our uh, global report on adult learning and education uh, and in this report, also, you can find some data uh, regional on a regional level, but also on the global level uh, on the women participation in adult learning and education. Uh, some of the issues of this global also look at the economic empowerment uh, and also the integration of women in labor market. 
So uh, maybe in the chat, we will uh, also provide you with a link. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Salim, from the, uh, also the study you have mentioned, and also we will find, uh, post a link from the global report. So uh, Ms. Claire, uh, there's also maybe uh, another question that uh, what information resources on funding programs, uh, okay, but maybe this for non-EU countries, um, as a Republic of Moldova, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, would you recommend? So I'll, I'll first answer the, the first, yes, the first yes. question. I'd like to add something about the first question. Uh, so about, about how to empower women. So I think one important thing to look at is uh, experience with micro credit, with micro credit. And so micro credit uh, organizations have tried to specifically target women to empower them. Uh, and they've been doing research on that. So I don't know, I cannot tell you what are the results exactly, but if you are interested in this question, I think microcredit is something to, to look at. Uh, uh, in, with a historical perspective, um, I look at the role of banks too on how to empower women. And so for example, savings banks uh, in, uh, in Europe and also in the US were targeting women in particular to encourage them to open account and saves to gain to gain uh, to gain economic uh, independence and, uh, and and control over the finance of, of the household. So this is these are the two things I would I would look at uh, how savings banks in history have targeted women and, and the role also of, of microcredit to to empower women. Um, then about the second question. Um, uh, so the, yeah, so I I I, I I'm not sure. I, I am the best to answer this question about the information resources. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll pass it to, to Salim. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Salim, if you would like, uh, or you have something to add in the second question. Uh, uh, you mean on, can you repeat again? Uh, what information uh, resources on funding programs for non-EU countries, such as the Republic of Moldova, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, would you recommend? Again, I also, this is not the area that I would, uh, or the countries that I would uh, uh, work uh, work on. And it's, uh, we all know the, the issue of Ukraine at the moment and how unstructured uh, education might be in the presence of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, let myself comment on this. Uh, I would let it for an expert to, because due to the sensitivity of the area and the needs. So uh, I would I would also pass on this question, to be honest. Thank you very much. It's fully understood. Uh, just maybe the last question, and then I will have a question from my side, and then maybe we can uh, already get the opinion of the participants and we close our talk for today. So the last question is, uh, could the panelists recommend resources in older adults who would like to have a greater understanding of how to approach financial issues, such as inflation, the impact of retirement? Ms. Claire, if uh, you feel like answering the question. Uh, so this is, this is an excellent question. Um, so, I, I I don't I don't have the perfect answer because I don't work on on the dissemination of, of this knowledge in, in particular. But uh, I think central banks normally should have a good um, at least some, like I know that in Canada they have like a, uh, they provide some material on their website to understand, for example, what is inflation and how they target inflation. Um, then yeah, and then I would recommend like newspaper of a high quality. Like uh, normally, their articles should offer a good a good explaining of 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 this. But uh, like I think also it really matters in which country uh, the person is and what kind of material the person is looking for. So I'll I'll pass on also on, on this question of uh, of the dissemination of this of this knowledge. Thank you. Same uh, for you, Mr. Salim. If you feel like. Uh having any answer for this question or to add. So to confirm that I understood the question correctly, so you're looking for dissemination strategies 
on financial literacies and other type of learning for females in different uh, so so this is what you're asking for may i repeat the question again uh, uh, the the speak or the participants asking if the panelists uh, recommend resources for older adults who would like to have greater understanding of how to approach financial issues such as inflation the impact of retirement so it's targeting the older adults and the old, you mean the older population, you mean exactly. the ones that are above the age of 64 and above, you mean those who are uh, retired. Uh, this, this is different between uh, different parts of the world. In, in uh, developed countries, um, uh, looking at websites and looking at um, uh, and, and specialized articles that discuss issues on inflation and any other issues might be uh, helpful. However, um, we have multiple issues in, in, in developing countries and these developing countries where there is a good amount of illiteracy rate, one, and the second thing is that access to information or access to internet in order to get the information needed is not there. So, and here plays the role of uh, international NGOs, NGOs, and enhancing the curriculum, education curriculum, or creating specify, spe specialized programs for um uh, uh, older individuals in order to benefit uh, from uh, such uh, 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 such an exercise now, this is uh, my two cents on this uh, on this question thank you so much uh, just to uh, of course um, it's already we are approaching one hour for today and maybe we can finish today earlier I would like just from the speakers to get from each of you if you would say two key recommendations, that the policy education policy makers should consider to have an inclusive financial literacy. So, Ms. Claire, I will start with you. Okay, so two key recommendations. Uh, the first one is uh, start, uh, it's really important to start early at school and with and focus on the very basic principles of what inflation is what are composed interest rates and how savings and be borrowing uh, behaviors can affect wealth over the the long run as uh, that would be the first one and then and then the second one would be more about like the consumption patterns so at any time in the life of of people um it's also important to understand that what we call inflation is one number, but that it covers many different realities. And so to explain like which, what is affected the most by inflation, what is not, and who are infected, affected the most by inflation and who are not, so that uh, households, they know how to allocate their spend, like their expenses, as they understand how it affects them. And also policymakers are aware of uh, what kind of policy can can affect uh, what which uh, how how to better address the issues faced by the most vulnerable uh, in in the population. Thank you very much. Uh, same for you, Mr. Salim. Uh, two recommendations from your side for education policymakers. Okay. I first of all, I wanted to to make a small note. Uh, inflation is not always bad because sometimes when a country is facing higher economic growth uh, 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 it will create additional inflation and when i say by let's assume that countries have low inequality then even in the presence of inflation females are having a better living conditions uh, so to start with i would uh, rephrase the question how uh, uh, people, what kind of economic literacy and not just financial literacy that is required fee for females in economic crisis and not just financial crisis. And this would include different kind of economic crisis. Um, based on ESCO skills monitor and the information that we have found, uh, we have seen that there is 
a large number of skills, demanded skills that are sustainable over time, that you can teach them once or you can teach them and they stay for a longer period of time. Unlike, for example, programming nowadays and the presence of chat GPT, the uh, programmers might lose their job eventually in like one or two years because anybody can write a code on chat GPT. However, something like basic financial literacy, basic computer literacy, uh, communication, um, 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 risk, uh, 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 crisis response prevention uh, uh, methodologies, such, such, such um, uh, uh, programs or such skills, demanded skills, uh, are very sustainable and they can stay for a longer period of time. So what's, what can we tell edu educators and policymakers who are uh, uh, in charge of education and higher education? And as Claire mentioned, start early on with sustainable skills. And one of them is financial literacy or contingency plan in economic hardship or entrepreneurship or creativity or teamwork, et cetera, et cetera, in order to prepare the society, including females, for a better future in, in case of different states of the world. So this is, this is how I would, I, I would say um, what I wanted to say is that there is a huge number of financial literacy skills that could be taught early on, even at primary school, uh, to students in order to prepare them for a uh, future crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think the key takeaway is not early just to uh, also empower the people, empower the individuals with uh, learning opportunities, of course, equal learning opportunities and gender responsive. Uh, as said, I mean, uh, this is the aim of these talks is really to have uh, this kind of informal learning to make sure that lifelong learning through all of its modality, either the formal, non-formal, informal matters and makes also a difference in knowledge sharing. So uh, thank you again very much to all the distinguished speakers and thank you for accepting our invitation and for your insightful and very uh, concrete examples, which I think can inspire a lot of us. Uh, and we, have, we hope that we also as a UIL find common uh, maybe interests and also areas of work. Uh, before closing today, we would like also to get the opinion of the participants on how was the talk today. Uh, and also to get your view, what would be the next topic of our talk? Therefore, we would launch now a, a, a poll, a small survey, just to get your insights. So we, we would be very much appreciating if you can please uh, share with us your view. So uh, again, thank you very much for everyone, uh, to all the participants for your engagement, um, also for your uh, attention to our uh, talk today. Uh, and we hope to see you in other talks. And of course, we invite you also to check our UIL website where you can get more information on our program uh, and also the activities of work, including the gender equality, uh, among other a lot of uh, other areas, uh, and also to get more information about the upcoming gender talks. Again, extended thanks to uh, the speakers of today, uh, and we hope to see you again. And thank you very much.